Hello and welcome to today's webinar in which you will learn all about corn types. The title is Hybrid, Double Cross, and Open Pollinated Corn. What does it all mean? This is your host, Alice Formiga from eOrganic, which is the organic agriculture community at extension.org. We have many webinars about organic farming and research, and they are all recorded and available in our archive at extension.org and also on the eOrganic YouTube channel. The presentation will last about 45 minutes and then we'll have time for questions. We'll be reading as many questions out loud as we can after the presentation is over. So today I'm very glad to welcome our presenters, Margaret Smith, who's a professor of plant breeding and genomics at Cornell University, and Richard Pratt, who is a professor in the plant and environmental sciences department at New Mexico State University. They're both members of a NIFA OREI funded research project called Breeding Non-Commodity Corn for Organic Production Systems. So now I'm going to hand over the screen controls to our first presenter, who is Margaret Smith. Okay, thanks very much, Alice. Thanks very much and thanks to all the people who are listening online. Um, I hope you'll find this an muted conversation. And before we move ahead to actually tackle the, to the topic of hybrids and double crosses and open pollinated corn, I did want to say a little bit about the project that Rich and I are both a part of. So um, we're a group of corn breeders that you can see some of them pictured in the bottom right there, standing in front of what, one of our landmarks here at Cornell University, which is the old pollinating shed that Barbara McClintock and a bunch of other corn geneticists worked from back in the early 1900s. It's still there, so we love that spot. So we're a group of corn breeders who are working on breeding non-commodity corn for organic production systems. The work is funded by a grant from USDA NIFA, as Alice pointed out, and our goal is to produce new corn varieties, particularly for US certified organic production systems. This map shows you the locations where we're working. I'm located in the top right there in Ithaca, New York. Rich, my other co-presenter, is in Las Cruces, New Mexico. We've got several locations in between where colleagues Paul Scott, Walter Goldstein, and Kevin Montgomery are working. And for many years recently, we've had a winter nursery, organic winter nursery site in Lajas, Puerto Rico. Of course, we're all very concerned about whether that's going to be up and functional and how our colleagues there are doing right now. So no news on that yet, I'm afraid, but we're hoping for the best. So the topics for today, this is just one piece of the outreach and extension we're doing associated with this project. We wanted to talk about the different kinds of corn varieties. People often have questions and confusions. What's an open pollinated corn variety? How is that different from a hybrid? What about single crosses versus double crosses? What other kinds of varieties are out there? There are lots to choose from. And I'll try to wrap up by talking about some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of these various different types of corn varieties. They all have their pluses and minuses. So we'll plunge right in then to what is an open pollinated corn variety. And the way you can really describe this is that it's a group of similar plants. Their performance can be distinguished from other varieties. And this is really where the earliest agriculturalists began the process of corn improvement. When they selected and chose what seed to save, like you see in that page on the right there from the Florentine Codex, when they selected what seed to save, they began to save plants that had traits that were useful to them. So the varieties that the earliest domesticators created were open pollinated varieties. They were genetic mixtures in different places. Each mixture was slightly different because farmers saved the seed that fit their particular needs, their agroecology, the appearance and color and texture of kernels they wanted, the end use traits they wanted to use it for, and the other needs of their farming community. So in each place, a slightly different mix was created. Um, the plants in an open pollinated variety are genetically different from each other. So the seed for the variety would come from harvesting one or more ears. Each of those ears would include a number of kernels for which the pollen might have come from anywhere. So you can see this picture of Mexican June, which is an open pollinated variety here on the left. All those plants shedding pollen create this pollen cloud up in the top of the, the uh, field where the tassels are. So any given silk on the ear might be pollinated by pollen from any number of possible plants. 
When you harvest that ear, as in the diagram on the right, uh, shell the seed off, that would be the seed that's planted. Each seed gives rise to a plant that's genetically different from every other one. So each one has its own constitution. They may have all come in this case from only one mother plant, but from various different fathers. So each of these is some kind of a cross, but a cross between the same mother and different fathers. When you save numerous ears from a field, you then have numerous mother plants and a many, many, many possible different father plants. So the open pollinated variety um, has plants which are genetically different one from another, but they all have certain traits that make that variety distinguishable, whether it's yellow kernel color and early maturity, or blue kernel color and soft flowery kernels that make great tortillas, or whatever it might be. An open pollinated variety of this sort can be reproduced simply by saving seed from the field that it was grown in. That will again be a representation of the mix of plants that were in that open pollinated variety and the mix of genetic types. You need to be careful about how much seed you save. If you save too little, you may be losing diversity and therefore suffering from what we call inbreeding depression, a loss of diversity because the plants um, crossing with each other are too closely related. So for seed savers, it's recommended that at least 500 plants be sampled to create the seed of the next generation to avoid that loss of diversity. But also notice that the nature of the variety will be affected by the location and the selection you impose when you save your seed. You and I could both plant the same lot of open pollinated corn seed, and if I saved the ears that I thought were best in my environment, and you saved the ears that were best in your environment, after a few generations, those varieties might be slightly different. Mine, tailored to my production conditions and my view of what the best and most appropriate characteristics of that variety are, and yours tailored by exactly the same thing. So open pollinated varieties do change over time. This next slide just shows a number of examples. The, uh, the picture of the plants here happens to be Iroquois white corn. It's a Native American open pollinated variety from this area. You can see the plants are diverse, taller and shorter, different placement of ears. The other four are just pictures of ears of open pollinated corn varieties. Some very similar in appearance, like this reed's yellow dent. Some much more variable, painted mountain, includes pretty much every color that corn comes in, but you can still see traits that unify it as an open pollinated variety. They're all very long, thin ears with relatively few kernel rows. So it's those traits that, that describe a variety that distinguish one open pollinated variety from another. So what then would be a hybrid, and how does that differ? I'm going to turn that question over to Rich to follow up on. Okay, wonderful, great. A hybrid is muted by a controlled cross between two different parents, and it's called the F1 or the first filial generation. So you may have heard the term F1, but you might not have realized that the word that the F stands for filial. So that filial generation is the subsequent generation or the offspring. So in this case, then, a hybrid has two parents. And here in the diagram, parent A is the female parent. And you can see the tassel has been removed from the female parent. Then the male parent to the right is the pollen parent. And you can see diagrammatically that the pollen cloud is landing on the silks of the female parent. So we would call that hybrid an F1 as we would uh, because that is the, the F1 seed that's produced is the first filial generation. And we call that a single cross. So commercial hybrids then that are, are usually produced using this technique, and they're often produced with inbred parents. So those parent stocks, A and B, are very often patented by the large seed companies and they are proprietary. But basically, um, those seed that are marketed then are uh, commercial hybrids. 
and uh, the F1s uh, have a very similar nature. They are pretty genetically uniform. And so those hybrids that are produced from those inbred parents, which are typically very homogeneous, very homozygous, very genetically uniform, are in turn going to produce very genetically uniform hybrids. And that's important to a lot of producers in a highly mechanized context. So if you regrow those hybrids, you can keep them indefinitely and you can remake that exact hybrid, that exact F1, as many times as you want to. And it's not going to change over time in the way that Margaret explained an OPV might change over time in different environments subject to selection by different growers. So almost all of the individual plants are hybrids because they arose from that pollen cloud and multiple females that are all a little bit different. So all of those plants in the OPV are a bit different and they're producing um, non-uniform plants. So here's a, a really great illustration of inbred parents planted next to an F1 hybrid. And so you can see the hybrid vigor, the increase in size, um, and often the, the maturity is a little bit earlier, and that's desirable, certainly in, in more northern production regions. And in maize, there's often, in, when you pair the right inbred parents, you get a lot of increased yield. And that's not so much the case with a lot of other species, but with maize, if you find the right combination of parents, you get a really serious yield boost. So those inbred parents, um, you know, we have the term inbreeding depression. And so those, during the inbreeding process, those per parental lines become somewhat reduced in vigor. And so they produce smaller plants and smaller ears, but it's restored. That, that hybrid vigor is really manifested when you cross just the right inbred parents with each other. So it doesn't mean that you can cross any corn with any other corn and get that kind of hybrid um, vigor and yield. It, it's really a lot of the breeding work goes into finding really superior inbreds that really give a superior hybrid. So just to mention that uh, sometimes uh, people think that you cannot save seed from hybrids. Um, you know, many commercial hybrids are, uh, have IP protection of one kind or another. And um, um, so you're, you know, you're restricted in what you can do with them. But from a biological standpoint, yes, those seed are viable. The, the seed that's harvested from uh, an F1 is indeed viable. But what happens is they're, you're going to lose a lot of that hybrid vigor. And so they're not going to yield as much as the original F1. And they're going to segregate and they're not going to be genetically uniform anymore. And so there'll be variation now for maturity, uh, height, vigor, all of those things. And so, uh, Margaret, if you'd be so kind, maybe just back up one slide. I, I did want to point out that when those hybrids are produced, um, the females are detasseled, as you saw in that diagram. And so here in a seed production field, you can see where the pollen parents, the male parents, have not been detasseled, so they can produce that pollen cloud for the adjacent female parents. Thanks for, for backing up that slide. And I'll go ahead and, and uh, toss it back to you, Margaret. 
Okay, thanks, Rich. So you heard about what a single cross hybrid is. Another of the terms we hear a lot is a double cross hybrid. So I just wanted to talk a bit about what the difference is between those two. The one Rich talked about most was the single cross hybrid, which is a cross between two true breeding or inbred parents. And Rich talked a lot about the breeding work that goes into identifying the right pair of parents to really give you a superior hybrid. These are the kind of things that when you drive around, you see a field that looks like this, where the plants look extremely similar one to another. All the tassels the same height, all the ears the same height. That's what a single cross hybrid looks like. Every plant is genetically the same as every other plant in the field. Each plant has genetic diversity within it because it's a product of two different parents. However, each plant is the product of the same two different parents, so they all look the same as each other. If you do see variation, and this is a photo from New York State this year, that's a single cross hybrid field, but those big dips are variations that are caused not by the genetics, but by the environment. We had, any from anyone from the Northeast will know, we had endless rain from April through about July this year. So every wet spot in the field created a wave like this of poor vigor, nitrogen deficient corn. That's variation that's environmental. You can see in the parts of this field that were relatively decent, there's that tremendous uniformity that you get from a single cross hybrid. So variation in the single cross hybrid, it's about field variation that's affecting the plants, not about genetic differences from one plant to the other. A double cross hybrid in contrast has four parents, the grandparents of it. The pairs of grandparents are crossed in two pairs to make two parental F1 single crosses. Those two single crosses are then crossed again to make the double cross. So it's really like a set of siblings that um, are a product of their four grandparents. The siblings is the double cross hybrid. The grandparents are the four parents. And the two, the, the two parents of those siblings are the crosses between those parents. So I'll show you a diagram to make that a little less obscure. So here we have what would amount to a single cross A times B. And again, you see the detasseled female. The pollen comes from the male. The resulting single cross will be one parent of your double cross. C times D, two different inbreds again. Cross them. So the second parent of the double cross is a cross between C and D. When you make this cross between A times B, you cross it with the hybrid C times D. Again, one of them is the female. It's detasseled. The pollen comes over from the male. This is the seed you harvest to be planted. And that's the double cross hybrid seed. So a product of four different, typically, again, very inbred uniform parents. So one of the characteristics of a double cross is that it will be a little more variable, genetically variable, than a single cross because these double cross plants aren't all genetically identical to each other. They have different combinations of the genes that were present in those four original grandparents. The single cross, on the other hand, each plant has a combination of the genes from just their two parents. So you can see the ears are all at the same level here in the single cross. The tassels are, are at the same level, although they don't look at it. This was a photo I took the other day in the field and the plants kept falling over and sliding and tassels were breaking and the wind was blowing. But these are very genetically similar. You can see here the ear height shifts around from down here to up there. Plants are different, tassels are different heights. So the double cross is a little more variable than a single cross. The seed parents for the seed that's sold to farmers are vigorous. They are themselves hybrids, not those um, inbreds Rich was talking about that have shown inbreeding depression, but hybrids. So one of the advantages for producing organic hybrid seed is that if you have a vigorous seed parent, it will compete better with weeds in the organic seed production field. And the photo at the bottom of this slide is actually an organic seed production field for a double cross hybrid. The plants you see right in the center front there are the females. They've been detasseled 
and you can see along the left and the right edges of the photos male pollinator rows that will be providing the pollen. Both the male and the females in this case are single cross hybrids themselves. So they are a little easier to manage in an organic seed production because the plants are more vigorous and more leafy and they compete a little better with the weeds. Also the seed cost on a double cross hybrid can be lower because the seed you're actually purchasing to plant in your field was itself produced on a vigorous hybrid plant. Hybrid ears yield more than inbred ears and you may remember that from those pictures of the inbred ears and the hybrid ears that Rich was showing you. A hybrid ear is bigger, it has more uniform seed, it has larger seed. So the seed cost for a double cross hybrid can be less than what it is for a single cross hybrid. So for those various reasons, they offer some potential advantages in the organic seed production area where managing weeds in a field of non-vigorous small inbred plants can be a real serious challenge. Great, thanks very much, Margaret. I'm really happy to talk about synthetic varieties because the word synthetic seems a little peculiar or maybe out of place when we're, we're talking about plants. And it's, it's not like astroturf or polyester suits or something like that. It's just the word synthetic is because someone sort of decided to create a population by pulling different germplasm together and sort of synthesizing or creating a population. So it's like an OP, open pollinated variety in, in some ways. And what, Margaret, can we just slip back to the slide before that? Yeah, great, thanks. Um, there we go, wonderful. So you intercross, um, frequently the germplasm that's selected is, is uh, oh, maybe uh, eight or 10 different inbred lines that combine well or complement each other very well. So it's sort of like an, um, uh, the breeder is trying to put together a lot of favorable traits. Uh, some inbreds may really give a good uh, yield, other but be disease susceptible, whereas inbreds may not be quite so good for yield, but they really have great defensive traits, uh, host resistance and uh, stay green. Uh, and so the breeder kind of wants to put all of those good traits together in a population. And so they've often been used for breeding purposes. They might be called breeding populations. Uh, and, they're, and they undergo recurrent selection over time to, to make them even better. Um, but synthetics are used really quite a bit in a lot of other countries. Uh, where farmers do want to save their seeds uh, and where there are uh, breeding programs trying to provide superior varieties to them. Um, so we wanted to be sure to talk about those a little bit because um, people may not have heard about them quite so much as open pollinated varieties. So th they tend to be um, similar sort of in their genetic makeup to an open pollinated variety, but they typically have been subject to a lot of uh, selection pressure from breeding programs. Uh, they have to be maintained in isolation, uh, but and they also sort of provide an opportunity for inbred development. So uh, let's go ahead to the next slide. And here I wanted to choose some examples. Um, so here, uh, you know, I, I think uh, breeders maybe suffer from writer's cramp fairly easily, you know, so they abbreviate everything. And so Iowa stiff stock synthetic is known as BSSS. And then there are other um, synthetic populations um, from the Iowa State program, the Joint University ARS program. And so you see these more complicated uh, designations, and then you start seeing things like C4, which stands for cycle four of a recurrent selection program. And you can see here's an example of Iowa two-ear synthetic that's undergone 14 cycles of selection. So this literally crosses generations of breeders sometimes. Here's another designation where SIN shows up, short for synthetic, uh, 
from the Canada University of Guelph program. And so this one, A, has 20 short seasoned inbreds, and Sin B has Andean germplasm and adapted inbreds. So you can see the goal there is, you know, introgressing some traits from what breeders would call exotic germplasm. And then there's a population I released when I was at Ohio State, and we call that Ohio synthetic population number three. And this happened to, happened to be cycle five, which was selected quite a bit for host resistance to viral pathogens. So I checked at Grin, you know, if you had an interest in acquiring a synthetic from our national germplasm collection, you know, could you search? And, you know, it's actually very difficult to find them um, because of the this nomenclature, because of all these abbreviations. Um, so I'm happy to say, and I think this will show up in the next slide, uh, is where, there it is in the uh, insert, is as part of our OREI corn breeding project, we have done multi-location evaluations of a lot of open pollinated varieties and a lot of synthetic populations. And so if that's of interest to you, our good friends at Practical Farmers of, of Iowa have um, uh, provided that access to that data for everyone. So there's a website uh, you might have an interest in, in visiting. So if we could uh, go to the next slide then. Uh, other kinds of varieties, and you know, sometimes you'll hear the term modified hybrids, and uh, they exist, they're, they're not terribly common, but for example, a three-way cross hybrid would be the single cross hybrid we described earlier, that's then crossed with a third parent, uh, and that might be an inbred, doesn't have to be, but it, uh, it's usually an inbred uh, used as the male. And so that has the advantages of a double cross where when you're using a single cross hybrid as your female to produce this three-way hybrid, uh, you get the advantage of that bigger and larger ear from that female seed parent. So it's got some of those advantages of the double cross, but with a little bit less variability. So that would be an example um, of another type of hybrid. Um, if we could go to the next slide, uh, we can even expand sort of our, our concept of, of hybrids, uh, sometimes crossing OPVs or crossing improved maize populations. Um, so this won't work for all combinations, but for some, we might observe some hybrid vigor. And this is something that has been the, the subject of research and, and scientific publications. So if we could go to the next slide, sort of, so consistent with that idea of crossing OPVs or improved populations, one might cross synthetics that were selected for specific traits. And, and this has also been done commercially. And here's an example of a patent that was filed uh, for a commercial or a potential per commercial product um, that is the combination of crossing two synthetic populations. So I think um, I've, I think we've really expanded your your worldview, perhaps, of the different types of open pollinated varieties and and different types of hybrids that can be produced. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Margaret to talk a little bit about the advantages and the, the disadvantages of these different types of, of corn varieties. At the, at the end of this other kinds of varieties section, one of the advantages of being a corn breeder is that corn breeding, like any other kind of breeding, is not a recipe. It's a set of tools. So you have tools like crossing that can lead to vigor. What you cross, you can get really creative about that, as Rich's discussion has just showed you. You can cross inbreds, you can cross populations, you can cross synthetics, you can cross a whole lot of stuff and just keep it mixing. So one of the fun parts about being a breeder is you can 
may, you can take these different tools like crossing and inbreeding and use them in any number of ways. It's probably also one of the things that makes the outputs, the products, so many varied and confusing. So with that, I'll go on to advantages and disadvantages, and I'm just gonna summarize a number of the points we've made during the course of this description for three things, the open pollinated varieties, the double crosses, and the single crosses. Please remember that there are, are other kinds of varieties we could think about. So for open pollinated varieties, you do have a variety that includes a mixture of different genetic types. That can be helpful if you have variable conditions in the field. For example, you have a field like I showed you with wet spots. If you have a, a single genotype, it's gonna do well in one part or another part of that field, but probably not everywhere. If you have a mix of different genotypes, like an open pollinated variety, there may be plants out of that mix that do better in any one part of the field. So you may have a few things that do well, even in the wet spot, although there will be a lot of others that don't. So there's this kind of buffering against variation in the field and year-to-year -year variation. People talk about it, it's as stability. You know, it may not yield real high, but it will yield something year in and year out if it's a good open pollinated variety. Not everyone will do that, but a good one may have some buffering against the kind of large variation you can see from place to place in the field or from year to year. The seed of an open pollinated variety is probably going to be less costly than for any kind of a hybrid. You want to produce it in isolation. Remember, you don't necessarily want it to cross-pollinate with other random things, but you don't need to produce it by controlled crossing like you would need to for a hybrid. It's, it's a mix of whatever the genotypes in the field are. Yield for an open pollinated variety is generally lower than for a good hybrid. Why? Well, the open pollinated variety is a mix of different plants. Some of those are gonna be better yielding than others. The hybrid is a very selected single genotype or few genotypes that were chosen for being high yield. So you just don't have as big a distribution from plant to plant. That tends to mean a higher average for the hybrid than for the open pollinated variety. I find in my work, and you'll probably see if you look at some of that data that Rich referred you to about open pollinated varieties, that stock quality is often not as good. They simply haven't been selected as intensively and for as many generations for really strong stalks and good standability. So that's often one of the downfalls of open pollinated varieties. That will depend on which variety you choose. Some of them are better than others. So moving on to the double cross hybrids, and this is again a summary of advantages and disadvantages, but basically in comparative terms. A double cross hybrid is going to be typically less variable than an open pollinated variety. It does have a bit of genetic variability, which may provide some of that buffering I talked about, probably not as strong as for a good open pollinated variety. Compared to the open pollinated variety, the double cross would typically have higher yield and more uniform trait expression. Remember, it only has those four grandparent genotypes. So you don't find as many genetic combinations as with an open pollinated variety where it's a product, the seed you save is a product of 500 or 1,000 different plants, each of which is genetically distinct. So higher yield and more uniform trait expression than for an OPV. The seed cost will be higher than with an open pollinated variety, but typically not as costly as for a single cross hybrid. Producing seed of a double cross needs isolation fields. You have to avoid pollen contamination, and you need those isolation fields for two generations, the grandparent generation as well as the parent generation, and you need each of those generations to have controlled crossing. However, the seed yield is pretty high on each plant because the parent of the seed that you're going to grow as a farmer is itself a hybrid. So it has those larger ears, bigger and more kernels, so higher seed yield, and therefore somewhat lower seed cost. For the single cross hybrids, these would typically have a good single cross hybrid would have the highest yield potential. Now I wanna stop right there and make it really clear that whether something is really high yielding or not 
is a function of the particular hybrid and the environment in which you grow it. So I could sit here today and choose an open pollinated variety that would yield more than a double cross, that would yield more than a single cross if I chose a really lousy single cross and a pretty lousy double cross. But if you pick the best of what fits your environment, the best single cross or among the best single crosses and among the best double crosses and among the best OPVs, typically the single cross will be the highest yielding one. Double cross is next, OPs after that. For the single cross, remember the plants are really genetically similar one to another, so you get that tremendous uniformity in the field. If you have very variable or stress conditions in the field, that one genetic type may not turn out to have been the best choice, where a somewhat more variable double cross or a considerably more variable open pollinated variety might have given you a little more in that particular field than the single cross if it just happened to not be suited to those conditions. The time when somebody can tell me what the conditions will be next year, maybe I can recommend the perfect single cross hybrid, but until we know what next season's growing conditions are, we have to assume that they're gonna be different from this year, but that's about all we know. Single crosses are gonna have the highest seed cost because they need isolation, they need controlled crossing between two parents, and the seed that a farmer is going to plant is produced on an inbred seed parent, which is lower vigor and has smaller ears and fewer seeds. So the seed yield from a seed production field is going to be lower, meaning the seed cost is going to be higher. So that's my quick summary of advantages and disadvantages of those three general types. Rich also mentioned some of the comparative similarities between things like synthetics and population crosses and the open pollinated varieties. So you might assume some of those advantages and disadvantages will be fairly similar for those types. With that, I'd like to just wrap up by acknowledging the cooperators on our Organic Research and Extension Initiative project. Alice Formica, who works for eOrganic and introduced this webinar. Thank you, Alice. Our breeding colleagues, Walter Goldstein from the Mondaman Institute in Wisconsin, Kevin Montgomery from Montgomery Consulting in Illinois, Rich Pratt, who spoke to you today from New Mexico State University, and Lois Grant, who works closely with him on this project at New Mexico State, Paul Scott, our USDA ARS colleague at Iowa State University, myself at Cornell, and our thanks and our thoughts to Brian Bruner and his staff at the University of Puerto Rico, we have not been able to have direct contact with them, so we don't have any news of how they are. And of course, we would like to acknowledge and thank the USDA NIFA's Organic Research and Extension Initiative Project for funding our organic corn breeding work. With that, I'll say thank you. Unmuted. Back to Alice to moderate questions. Okay, well, thank you, Margaret. Um, we are now, we now have plenty of time for questions. Um, we had a question about what traits you are actively selecting for, for organic production. Okay, I was going to say, Alice, maybe you can send it one way or another first so that Rich and I don't talk on top of each other. But since I started, I'll start on that one. Um, so different cooperators on our organic research project have focused on different but complementary traits. I'm located in the Northeast and we tend to have a lot of challenges up here with both insects and fall disease pressure. We also have a somewhat shorter growing season and we tend to have heavy wet soils. So our selection here is done in organic systems for our organic breeding project. So we're therefore selecting things which will germinate and get out of the ground fast enough in those heavy wet soils in our relatively cool spring conditions here in the Northeast. And then we have a focus as well on insect resistance and disease resistance, particularly later in the growing season when those can become really problematic. Other colleagues at other sites are focusing on, on different things. So our colleague Walter Goldstein up in Wisconsin has done a lot of work selecting for nutritional quality, particularly high methionine and high protein and also um, uh, deep yellow color, particularly for poultry producers. So he's had a lot of focus on that. Um, our colleague Paul Scott at Iowa State and USDA ARS has worked extensively on the gametophyte trait, which is a trait that helps to exclude pollen from other typical corn belt dent corns 
And the idea there is to try to have a built-in mechanism that could help reduce the chance of pollen contamination by a genetically engineered corn on a, an organic corn crop. All of us, I think, have focused on yield and adaptation to organic systems. Kevin Montgomery in Illinois is working on multiple disease resistance. He's like the, um, the evil emperor of corn diseases. He throws every disease at those plants you can imagine and sees what survives. So a number of us are sending materials to him and letting him screen them and then send them back to us for breeding. I'll let Rich talk about the focuses of his program, but also I just wanted to say that one of the things we have done as a result of this project that otherwise probably wouldn't happen is we're making a lot of cross combinations between inbreds from what have been in the past rather isolated breeding programs. So one of the most promising combinations I have in my trials on organic farms right now is something that's a cross between one of Kevin Montgomery's parents and one of my parents. And I would have never found that without this collaboration. So those are some of the traits, and I'll let Rich chime in on any that I forgot and whatever he's working on. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, yeah, one I would point out is the um, cold shock test that uh, Kevin has arranged uh, each year. And uh, with, with our program here in New Mexico, in the uh, Chihuahuan desert environment, uh, heat stress is uh, something that we're certainly concerned about in the summer. And um, we feel, especially trying to, to be forward looking, we feel that our cooperative uh, OREI breeding program really has the opportunity for looking at broad adaptation and uh, not just in terms of uh, specific locations, but uh, abiotic stresses such as cold, the northern latitudes and then the heat stress here uh, in the semi-arid environment. So that's a very important one. Uh, we do see um, tassel blast and uh, leaf scorch and those sorts of things uh, and susceptible materials. And I'm very happy to say that we see a very good kernel set and, and uh, viable pollen production even when we have temperatures uh, for almost the whole day over 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and sometimes several days or more in a row. So that's very important for us. Uh, something else that's very important for us here in this environment, uh, we're really uh, very fortunate that uh, Native Americans have, have kept uh, their traditional open pollinated varieties uh, going for really several thousand years here in the Southwest. And, and maize is still uh, an important food here and uh, south of the border in Mexico. And so we're not so concerned with field corn uh, as we are now with food corn. And so obviously ear rot resistance becomes very important for us. And uh, we're starting to look at the uh, quality for um, tortilla products, for example, and we're looking looking at different pigmented types of corn, uh, white, blue, yellow in particular. And we're, we're also uh, very interested in the different flowery, dent, flint types as that relates to the different end products uh, that would be made. So uh, this is really a unique program as, as Margaret indicated. Uh, we share our germplasm. We, we help test each other's germplasm. Uh, we combine our uh, inbreds uh, to make test crosses and test across locations. And, and, uh, and again, as Margaret said, uh, you know, Kevin seems to have a terrific female parent that combines well with one of her experimental uh, breeding lines, and it also combines very well with one of ours. So uh, that's been a very encouraging and a very exciting outcome of, of this project. Okay. Um, well, we've got a bunch more questions coming in here. Um, this one um, might be a relatively simple one. What is the difference between stiff stock and non-stiff stock varieties? Yeah, I did mention the uh, 
stiff stock synthetic, which gets the SSS abbreviation. And then the non-stiff stock is uh, also what we would call a heterotic group. Uh, we really didn't go into that in the presentation, but the way to get that yield kick or to really get that heterosis in a, a good hybrid is to have the complementary germplasm. So those parent A's and parent B's, when they're coming from known heterotic groups that have a good reputation for combining with each other and making really good hybrids, um, we tend to give those heterotic groups names. So Iowa stiff stock synthetic is one of them. It tends to have a lot of reed yellow dent as sort of the, the old heirloom open pollinated variety uh, as sort of an ancestral germplasm base. And then non stiff stock synthetic means, well, it's not that. It's not, it's not um, the stiff stock synthetic heterotic group. It's, it's not reed yellow dent related. It's, it's not the stiff stock. So typically what kind of gets star billing there in the non-stiff stock synthetics is, is material that comes out of the Lancaster sure crop um, progenitor uh, that was an uh, open pollinated variety selected in, in Pennsylvania and Lancaster County. And then important inbreds, first generation inbreds came out of that like C103 then MO17, whoops, OH43 needs to slip in there between C103 and MO17, I think. Um, and it was found that, wow, those really combine really well with the inbreds that came out of Iowa stiff stock synthetics, such as B37, B73. Uh, so that's public germplasm uh, from the 20th century. And so, so, you know, it also sort of begs the question, these heterotic groups, uh, another one might be uh, iodent. Um, in other parts of the world, it might be uh, Tuxpeño types from uh, Mexico, from tropical materials. Um, it might be the uh, Antigua Grupo IIs coming from the Caribbean that were very important in Asia. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I think I elaborated on that question a little bit, but thank you for that question. Okay, um, let's see. When, you, when discussing options with organic producers, does the word synthetic make them nervous? And are, do you have any thoughts on how to communicate that that isn't a bad thing? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I had a chuckle when Rich talked about how it wasn't a polyester suit um, <laughs> or astroturf or whatever other example he used. It does have this this like unappealing plastic connotation to it that is not at all the case in the world of, of uh, plant breeding. Um, I think the... I think the way to talk about it, I haven't, I haven't personally had an experience where somebody thought synthetic, you know, and said, oh, we're, we don't use things that are synthetic. You know, I think that that would be a not surprising response. But I think the way to talk about them is to say, to describe that they are in fact a, a kind of open pollinated variety. And it's an open pollinated variety that was um, assembled with intention so it was assembled by a human. So perhaps that's where the synthetic piece comes from. But in, in much the same way that the original domesticators assembled their open pollinated varieties, in other words, choosing what seed to save or choosing what parents to put into the mix. So it was assembled by a human who was more of a plant breeder as opposed to simply a seed saver. So yeah, perhaps Mar that's a way to talk about it. Yeah, Margaret, I. I I'd like to add, uh, I guess I'd like to propose a new term and maybe it can start here today with this community. I think maybe we could call them designer varieties. Huh? Uh, I'll throw that out, I'll propose that. Okay, you heard it first right here. <laughs> um, anyway, um, the next question um, for Richard here. Um, can you describe the varieties that you were growing at the Native Seed Search Farm? Um, grandparents, parents, synthetics, or possible releases? So that was years ago at their uh, conservation farm. 
I think in Patagonia, Arizona, I had the, the great fortune of, of uh, working with the, the team there and uh, sort of what we might call a mini sabbatical. And the ones that we grew were the open pollinated varieties, the accessions in, in uh, their germplasm collection. And we were looking at that time um, primarily at the carotenoid pigments and the anthocyanin pigments, and that work was published in, in Economic Botany. Um, so those were open pollinated varieties. And I'm thinking that later on, uh, I'm not sure the, the listeners referring to, to that particular plot or a later plot where we did have uh, some open pollinated varieties and I believe we also had some of the tropical material that we're working with where we may have crossed uh, some of those with open pollinated varieties. So those, there were probably some population crosses in there. And as I recall, I heard some comments that the uh, gleaning yielded some really good polenta. So um, yes, I'd be happy to share the uh, the uh, identity of those if, if someone wants to try to make sure they have really good polenta again. <laughs> okay. Um, what's the division between fresh market processing and animal feed types in your programs? So I'll, I'll take a stab at that one for starters. Um, my program includes breeding both for organics and for conventional production systems. So here in New York State, our corn in both of those categories, conventional and organic, is about 50-50 for grain and for silage. And um, of the grain, the, uh, the amount that's for processing varies kind of depending on price and on the growing season and so on, how short farmers are for feed. The big industry in our part of the world is dairy. So a lot of the corn is grown in support of dairy, the silage, of course, and some of the grain as well. Um, we do test a few things and, and um, do a little work on the side for food corn. So I have a small amount of effort in, corn, in sweet corn breeding, of course, for, for food. And then also, I, I like all of breeders, I suppose, we have what we call our backyard projects or our um, border row projects, small things that we're doing around the edges. So I have one that I've been tinkering along with that is focused on trying to find a blue corn that would make nice polenta, um, two things Rich has just been talking about. And that would obviously be a, few, a food use. So it's, it's varied, but I would say for the, the, uh, the major part of the breeding program, it's kind of focused first on grain and secondarily on silage and the grain, you know, a lot of it for feed and some of it a variable share for industrial use. I, I would add that, um, you know, Margaret and I were, were comparing notes a little bit um, before the session today. And in, in New York, um, production is, is split, you know, sort of half field corn, half silage corn in terms of the, the large volume. Uh, and it's similar here in the Southwest, in, in Arizona and New Mexico, we have a couple hundred thousand acres of uh, uh, corn production. For, um, and a lot of that is for grain and a lot of that is for silage as well. Um, and we also, as I mentioned earlier, we have, uh, I think a growing uh, and uh, really wonderful uh, production here for uh, for food products, for human food products. And uh, so our program is um, uh, more balanced across those different areas now as well. And um, so it is, uh, we, we try to respond to the context and the needs uh, that are there in, in our area. And uh, I think that's reflected in, in both Margaret's program and my program. Okay, great. Yeah, we did have that question come in before the webinar from a cattle grower who was wondering about um, how you know whether um, corns are highly 
digestible because um, he grows some corn for local organic dairies and they prefer corn that's flowery and highly digestible. And then also he was wondering about the cobs um, because um, he harvests his corn on the cob for dairy feed. And so the cob for him is also an important consideration and some white cobs are more digestible than red cobs. So he was wondering about how the nutrient values and digestibility of the cob um, can be confirmed. So can you talk a little bit about that? You were talking about sending a sample somewhere. And so maybe for the rest of the listeners who might be interested in that, um, could go tell, tell us a little more about that. Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. So when you're when you're trying to assess quality, whether it's quality for grain, quality for whole ears, like that um, questioner was asking about, or quality for silage. Basically, the the way we handle it is take a sample as we're harvesting, and send it to one of the many laboratories that does feed quality analysis. And I think there's there's probably laboratories of this kind in most every state across the country. Um, they will then analyze it for all the relevant um, components that would affect how digestible and nutritional it is. So protein, carbohydrates, fats, oils, um, lignin, which is the part of the, the fiber in the plant that tends to um, slow down digestibility or reduce digestibility. And then there are, if you're an animal nutritionist, there are different types of lignin. There's some that's more digestible and some that's less digestible and different types of fiber that is more and less digestible. So they'll analyze all of those, those components and provide a, typically provide along with the analysis some information about how that compares to what you know might be an ideal digestibility profile for, for a dairy cow or for a, a poultry animal. I will also say that there are, you know, it's kind of a refreshing change that there's growing focus in the broader corn breeding community on evaluating things like silage for digestibility and trying to develop some corns that are very distinct. So soft kerneled corns that are more readily digestible as ear corn, um, types that have reduced lignin, so they're more readily digestible as silage. We, have, we even have up in our part of the world farmers who are asking, I haven't figured out how to do this yet, but um, some of the um, Amish and Mennonite community are asking about binder friendly corn. What are corns that you can chop with a, a horse drawn implement and bind and they will work well that way. So there are, there are definitely these niche um, needs or specific local needs for types of corn varieties. And I see, I see that as a place where projects like ours and some of the other smaller um, local or regional breeding efforts are beginning to um, develop some new things and focus on some traits that might not just be sort of the same old number two yellow dent for the corn belt that so much of U.S. corn breeding has, has focused on. I, I would just add that I, I, I appreciate the question and, and part of the question was about cobs. And, you know, the, the answer I would have is I don't know uh, about cobs. I think they're usually kind of left out of the question or left out of the conversation. And they're just, I think, usually assumed not to really contribute anything nutritionally. And so I think the, the person who's asking is on to what might be an important thing. And that is, you know, is there some sort of anti-nutritional factor associated with the uh, more pigmented cobs and I, I don't know the answer to that question I think that um, um, you know when we take samples for forage or silage analysis we you know we, we run the whole thing through the the ear and the, the stalk and it leaves and everything through a, a chipper shredder you know and send it off to a lab as, as Margaret alluded to for for an analysis, so it's all everything's all mixed together. I guess w what I might suggest is to really get at this. I think you have to maybe kind of partition things a little bit, and you know, um, get the kernels off, separate the cobs uh, from the vegetative material, and uh, to try to dig more deeply and, and get at the bottom of it. Hmm. 
Okay, well, I think that's it for the questions. I just want to remind everyone that if you have a question about organic farming, um, you're welcome to use the eExtension Ask an Expert service. And if you'd like to learn more about this project, um, breeding non-commodity corn for organic producers, um, you can learn more about it at the bottom link on your screen here. So it looks like that's it for questions. So I'd like to thank everyone who submitted the questions and thank you so much, Richard and Margaret, and thanks to everyone for joining us. And we look forward to learning more about this project in future webinars.